for our next presenters. They are collaborative presenters. So I'm gonna introduce two folks at the same time. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Patrick Bolin, who is a professor of biology and director of landscape and natural resources at the University of Central Florida. Prior to coming to UCF in 2010, he was a research biologist at Archibald Biological Station, which is one of the large, longest term prescribed fire programs in Florida. His research interest is in the area of urban ecology and he oversees UCF prescribed fire program. And presenting with him today is Brent Salisbury, who is a California native, studied at Humboldt State University and majored in forestry, specifically wildland fire management. He worked for Cal Fire throughout Northern California for four years on an engine crew and two state forests as forestry technician. In 2011, he relocated to Florida to join the Florida Park Services Hillsboro River State Park and District 4 Viper Burn Team, where he was able to apply the use of prescribed fire on the landscape and find his passion. He wants to make a difference with the use of prescribed fire, especially near the wildland urban interface as it relates to public safety and inspire youth to have a passion for land preservation. He now works at the University of Central Florida as a biologist and burn manager and on 800 acres managed by the Landscape and Natural Lands Department of UCF, where the fire team demonstrates the use of prescribed fire as an essential tool for land management and public safety in urban communities. He also currently serves as the treasurer of the Central Florida Prescribed Fire Council. If you all have been to UCF and, and seen what they're working with, this is definitely some serious urban interface. So we welcome both Dr. Patrick Bowen and Brent Salisbury. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Sammy. Thank, for that. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a, a pleasure to interact with uh, folks involved in prescribed fire. Uh, in in, uh, in Florida and in the Southeast, you know, we have a lot to be proud of, I think, in Florida for what we do. And uh, I feel honored to uh, have been part of it in some small way. I'm not really a fire person as far as uh, um, having, uh, you know, leading fires or being a burn boss. I'm not really a fire ecologist, but I do have uh, some experience, you know, having worked at Archbold, I saw that Kevin Maine was on here. Hey, Kevin. Um, you know, I got exposed to a lot of fire ecology. And of course, they have a long term uh, burn program, did some some burning on ranches, but um, most of my experience here uh, uh, with uh, overseeing fires at UCF, where I uh, was uh, overseeing, inherited an existing prescribed fire program, and then over the past 11 years really helped uh, to guide it to a more developed program. So I was very fortunate to be part of um, kind of the emergence of the UCF prescribed fire program, which was really led by, you know, some people that worked for me more than it was by me, but I, I did have the honor of overseeing that. And we've had great partners, you know, Zach was on earlier, Zach Pruzak, he's a UCF grad, go Knights. So, uh, you know, we appreciate the work we've been doing with him over time. Um, and uh, it's really been, like I said, a, a great experience. So I just want to give you a, an idea of what we, what we're doing here at UCF, both in terms of, um, our experience and how we have contributed to or tried to contribute to the development of this uh, area of burning at the wild urban interface, focusing kind of on our case study. Let me see if I can get my slides to progress here. They're not moving forward. Uh, there we go. Um, so first you're all familiar with this here in the Southeast. This is an article that's back in 2013, but looking at the, where are the biodiversity threats in terms of future land use in the United States. And we can see a lot of those threats are concentrated in the Southeast due to the uh, amount of biodiversity we have in this region and obviously as well to the development that's taking place. Um, the, the picture on the right really kind of shows incorrectly that our region, uh, it's mostly crop pasture expansion because if we look at projected future urban and suburban growth in Florida, that's where we really see a, a lot of uh, the steps of conversion um, is from crop and, and pasture to urban. And you're all familiar with the 1,000 Friends of Florida's trend analysis where they have shown um, that uh, there is a projection showing here in the, in the red portion of this trend that this is one outcome of existing comp plans for counties in Florida. We certainly hope it doesn't go this far, but we're going to go somewhere between where we are today, shown on the left and, and the right. And uh, Florida is really going to be a mixture of preserved land. We have a lot of great preserved land, as you all know, uh, agricultural land and urban. 
probably almost in a 30-30 mix um, uh, looking you know, forward to the next you know, few decades. UCF's kind of situated in an area like that. We have uh, a strong suburban development and a very rapid suburban development taking place. So we really do consider ourselves being a kind of the suburban uh, wildland interface, wildland suburban interface. You can see the campus here outlined in yellow. And then we've got, uh, re we're regionally significant. You know, all conservation boils down to where you're standing on planet Earth. And where UCF is, is really between the ensuing confluence of the Little Econ and Big Econ rivers. And those are major arteries of the wildlife and uh, nature corridors that exist in this region. So we're regionally very strategically significant because our natural lands, which you see drawn here in green, uh, uh, attach directly to those other uh, uh, lands. And, uh, and so we really have to be good stewards of what we have. Now, Back in uh, 2004, I believe, is when the UCF fire program started. We had some wildfires on campus, and there was a concern that uh, we needed to get a hold of that. So the, the administration was actually supportive of starting a prescribed fire program, mostly from a, a fire risk mitigation standpoint. And of course, uh, having taken that program over as an ecologist and having you know, developed the program, you start pretty soon, once you start burning, you start to increase the conservation value of your land. So now you're not just burning for um, uh, fire risk mitigation, you're starting to burn uh, and have important consequences for uh, conservation uh, that are regionally significant. Um, there are challenges, many of you may know this. Uh, this is one of our burns. You can see here on the left, there's a residential area just uh, to the east of us here. Uh, we have a relatively long unburned area. You can see the unit after it was burned here. Uh, we're right up against residential. We have a lot of neighbors, so we're very restricted, obviously, in terms of uh, when we can burn. And, and I think, um, you know, Brent's really going to go into that in his half of the talk. But we do have uh, restrictions, and we are uh, we have sporting events, we have softball tournaments, we have a football team. So uh, burning in this system, uh, you have to balance it against a lot of other competing demands. Fortunately, we have a wind uh, a wind um, sh uh, shed that makes it possible for us. Um, you all know the importance of seasonality, but I just like to emphasize for me, because when you're talking to some of the conservation folks who say, well, you need to be burning in the summer. I think we all know now that if you have long unburned fire suppressed areas and urban areas, you can't just go in in June and drop some uh, fire on the ground. Um, you really got to get the fuel loads down. And the way you do that progressively is by having winter burns first to get the fuel loads down, uh, maybe repeatedly. And then if you're lucky, depending on the situation, you might be able to get a more seasonal burn in, which we know has benefits for uh, native biodiversity. I just got a little, uh, we pulled together a little bit of data here. This isn't like a data heavy talk or anything, but this just shows you the total acres that we burned in five year period, starting in 2004. Uh, you know, uh, we burned a hundred acres in that four year period. And then you can see we burned a little bit more than that. So you can really see how much we've taken off. Uh, in the past five years and the acreage that we are burning. That has very much to do with the emphasis we placed on it, um, that we've really tried to stress the importance of it as a management tool. And we have staff that are uh, go-getters that wanna get out there and put fire on the ground because success builds on success, right? Um, so we've, we've had that success and it's also uh, part of uh, getting uh, areas in rotation. You can burn more frequently when you have areas in rotation because uh, you've, you've reduced the fuel loads and made it easier to burn. Uh, you, you've opened up the, the possibilities for more burns and burning under a more greater variety of conditions. And as we're gonna talk about, Brent's part of the talk is really gonna talk about well, how do you go into those long unburned areas that you've been avoiding that you thought you were never gonna burn and areas that my uh, predecessor land manager told me we're never gonna burn in that area, we're burning now. Uh, and so there are uh, some lessons learned that we've been able to apply so burning areas has never been burned and uh, getting things in, in rotation have enabled us to uh, greatly increase the amount of uh, area that we burn uh, over, over time. Um, we do have a fairly good grasp, although well, not a great grasp on our threatened and endangered species. Uh, uh, we all know that plants, um, uh, uh, pretty much from a conservation standpoint, get short shrift relative to animals when it comes to protection, but we do keep track of both our plants and animals. And we have a lot of um, uh, plants here that have showed up in much greater numbers now that we're burning such, you know, I'm showing the many flowered pink here, the orchid, 
And you can see uh, in the center of the pic where it's kind of popped up that, that fuchsia colored, pink colored orchid. Uh, so we do keep track of that. And again, once you start burning uh, and get it in, in going the way we have been, you're actually increasing the conservation value of the land. So you may have set aside the land as undeveloped, you start to burn, and then you start to increase the conservation value because you're exposing uh, the, uh, more of these endangered species and you're also encouraging their uh, proliferation. So, you know, we do try to keep track of that. And that's another way to sell it as part of our conservation plan. We do have a statutory requirement to have a campus conservation plan. So all this information really helps us. Um, and you kind of moving from that era of, of fire risk again towards, you know, we're doing this also for conservation. Uh, just, and this is very, you know, we, get, we, we, we collect very kind of uh, course level data, but you can see just uh, looking at the percentage change in species richness over four years. We see a reduction in trees, and Brent's going to talk about dieback in long unburned areas. Um, a little, you know, kind of neutral on shrubs. We have seen an increase in ground cover, obviously, um, in the areas that uh, have been burned more frequently, as you would expect. It's just nice to see that the numbers kind of come in some of the monitoring plots we've had. And we also realize now we really have to send up a better long-term monitoring system to document what's out there. And so we have a better idea of what is it that we're actually managing and be able to make the case for that management as well. Oops, sorry about that. A um, lot of gopher tortoises. We have very high numbers of gopher tortoises in these areas uh, that have increased due to the burning. Uh, lots of the wildflowers that have come back, just the native, uh, the native uh, flora and fauna that then is dependent on that. So, um, you know, really, really, again, we've not documented that maybe as best we can, but we all see it. Um, and really fire lanes are very important because those disturbed lanes uh, have a lot of wildflowers on them. So you gotta also think about how the, the tools of fire management contribute to these areas, especially these smaller areas where you have to burn up uh, smaller areas and have more fire lines in there. Gotta worry about inda uh, invasive species as well though. Um, I'm gonna let uh, Brent talk more about fire response. Obviously, you can see here, we're grabbing the grasses. A lot of, we got different species of wiregrass. We had Edwin Bridges, who you all know is, you know, one of the demigods of, of Florida botany. Um, you know, he was very impressed with our, with our uh, 100 acre area, how many species he found in, in one day uh, in these areas where we're burning. So we really have a tremendous amount of, uh, of biodiversity in this relatively small parcels, um, you know, a few hundred acres here on campus. Um, all the burning part and the great part about that, you know, with Brent here and Ray Jarrett, who was here before him and our current uh, leader of that program, um, we, we really couldn't do it without the MOU and the partnerships have been great. I don't get as involved in burns as my staff, obviously, but we've got TNC here, we've got Forest Service here, and uh, the MOU is really important because it, it adds just a lot of heft to all of the efforts when you when you can say, hey, look at all these partners we've got. And we all know that you know, people share their staff and they help out on burns. It's really great and it's been great for us. Um, and the other part is we do a lot of training. Uh, as uh, Zach pointed out, we did one of the infield trainings for the, the fire course. And this is just the recent one this year. Look how many people we had over here, wonderful trainers, even our own students shown here up on the left. Uh, we've had several of our own students go through and they help participate in the burns, which has been great. So I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's you know, been part of that. We've had a lot of staff that have contributed to it and our students obviously have been very involved. And, uh, and so I really appreciate that. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to Brent who's gonna get a little bit more of the details of how we've kind of transitioned into um, our uh, getting into long unburned areas with our fire program. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna, introduce a, uh, a model for success for y'all that have similar properties like this in urbanized communities. Um, Central Florida is growing rapidly as we've seen from Patrick's presentation. Uh, 2050 does not look good for land management. So we have to learn to live um, and burn around these communities. And I hope this uh, material is um, useful for y'all. And it's also, um, going to be something that is uh, a refresher as well. There's a lot of juicy information in here, so I, pro um, I apologize for it to be uh, very uh, data heavy, but the, the purpose of the, the rest of the program is to offer some guidance and recommendations for these reintroduction of prescribed fire and long unburned ecosystems. And the, the primary ecosystem we're looking at is wet flatwoods, mesic flatwoods, and scrubby flatwoods. So some of the concepts I introduced isn't really practical for scrub or prairies, 
Um, so if you have a flat woods fuel model, this is what this is pertaining to. Um, so you guys have all seen fuels like this around Orlando, you know, the 10 foot tall palmetto that Mike Orlando is standing in front of. Um, that is basically what Florida is. And because of fire exclusion the last 75 years, we've kind of got into a bad state um, in Florida and we're getting better. We, we, you know, we're burning about 2 million acres a year, but we still have a lot of properties like this that are getting neglected. So this is a map that Patrick showed. Um, this is an overview of our unit management map. Uh, so every unit of natural areas on campus has a designated uh, unit that we are trying to burn, manage for invasives. Um, and then we are burning in all of the areas except the McKay track, which isn't listed on here. It's about 250 acres of wetlands off the map. But in this study that we looked at, we looked at four years of burning in about 17 different um, ecosystems that range from 10 to 50 years without fire. And we uh, were able to look at that data carefully on weather, fuels, the objectives, what went right and what went wrong, and what can we do better in the future. And that's a, a map showing Lake Clare. Um, so if you've ever been to our football games or our, our campus, Lake Clare is on the northwest corner. And then we have the Arboretum, which is in the center. And then we have the East Parcel on the lower southeast side. And then the McKay track is on the, the west side. So these are the burn units that went into this study. So I was able to review um, the success of the burns that range from 10 to 50 years without fire. So our campus, uh, Florida Technical Institute, started in 1963. So we really don't have any burn data older than 63, but 60, you know, 50 years without fire, that's a, that's a long time and it's challenging. So by participating on burns directly, you know, reviewing the RX plan notes, conducting the data burn reports for fire effects and doing a post burn review every six months to one year after the burn, I was able to estimate the, the amount of pine mortality for each of these units as a measure for success. You know, when we burn at UCF, we try to limit pine mortality to 20% for every burn but some of these burns you see highlighted in red, um, the pine mortality got higher. And that's very common. A lot of you have burned in the same stuff and you see the same results. So um, what we know is from Morgan Varner, Kevin Hires, all these researchers that duff fires are the number one cause of pine mortality for these neglected units. So, but there's also some other factors that we talked about. Um, in 2019. So you have all been on burns where, you know, you got a little bit, um, you wrapped the corner too fast, um, you used too much head fire, and you caused mortality through this flaming effect. And this is called crown scorch or meristem damage. So when those surface flames become a crown fire, or if the surface flames get too high, um, they actually burn that pine meristem on the end of the branch, and that can affect and kill the tree. And you also cause the needles to burn. So if 80% or more of that um, canopy is reduced in one burn, it's not able to photosynthesize properly. So you probably killed the tree. And we all been on burns, you know, next week, the, the pine needles are like frozen in time. That's probably a flaming effect resulting from a, a high fire intensity. And we have seen that. We ha that was a primary cause in units 24, 25, and 26, where we had about 15 to 20% mortality. Now, this is the, the most common stressor that we experience that leads to more mortality that Morgan Varner talked about in 2019. Um, he also had a study in 2007 and 9 that hit on this. So we know that smoldering fire effects that happens during mop up and several days or weeks um, happens. And that, that usually happens when weather is not favorable. So smoldering effects kills trees through two methods. That's either through cambium girdling at the surface there's just too much heat at the base of the tree and it actually causes it to um, girdle, the same thing as chainsawing. And the second method is through the percent of fine uh, root loss in the organic soils. So anytime you see the presence of duff rings, that's probably a good indicator that mortality is likely to occur from your prescribed burn. And then a more interesting note is some of the pine mortality that resulted from secondary effects from forest pests, mainly bark beetles. So in units 20, 19, and 18, we had a stand, which I thought was southern pine beetle. Um, a year after the burn, 
the, the pine needles were green and all of a sudden we started seeing trees die off. So Jeffrey Eckwork from the Florida Forest Service, he's one of our entomologists. He helped me come down and actually survey a lot of these trees and figure out what the heck's going on with bark beetles. So we um, determined that the primary bark beetles included Ips and, and uh, black turpentine beetle. Um, those were, because of the duff and because of the bark beetles, it ultimately killed the tree. So some of our units after a year were green, the bark beetles came in because of that stress and, and finished them off. And then we also observed the Sawyer beetles and ambrosia beetles, and those are just common dairy, secondary pests, um, but they finish off the tree for us. So what can we do better in the future? So looking at the weather data, the field data, and these, uh, this study, we were able to come with a, field um, a fire model that should help you all that have backlog units. And the first thing that we always do, uh, fire line prep, um, and this is just for those 10 to 50 year old units, um, this model. So fire line prep is required for all our units. Um, we prior to prioritize campus safety for our students and our neighborhoods first. So with that, we have to do mechanical treatment. Uh, communicating with all stakeholders. So we have 64,000 students. We have um, professors, emergency managers that we communicate with. And we have about 20,000 residents that live next to us. So we want to communicate with all of them. And I'll share those apps with you. And then this uh, burning under the most ideal weather and field parameters. A lot of scientists and researchers have put a lot of effort into this. So I'll kind of sum up what I have come up with. And it, it overlaps. Um, closely with uh, Central Florida, um, keeping units smaller than 10 to 30 acres. Um, that's what we've been doing the last five years or longer at UCF. Will Kitchens uh, from the Florida Forest Service recommends this, and I agree with him because um, you don't want to be left alone mopping up with a small crew the next day or the next week. So keeping the unit small allows us to manage those burns effectively. And we also found some research that backs up that burning smaller reduces risk and reduces bark beetle attacks. Uh, we found that burning units in different areas of the forest helps and the timing. So we'll get back to the question, is frequency better than season? For bark beetles, the season is important because they're less active in the winter months. So maybe burning in the winter isn't always a bad thing for fuel loading. Um, the, the sixth step is assembling the best fire line crew and equipment. So you always wanna make sure you have plenty, of, have plenty of help from partners. Our MOU partners have helped us out a lot in the last five years. And in, in prior to Zach Kruzak and TNC, they helped us out in 2004 and five. So having the best crew, that leadership really helps our students um, and it builds confidence from the firefighter up to the burn boss level. And then we also have some special methods that we use, such as raking uh, class A foam that I'll share. And we've had some success with. So when communicating with neighbors, uh, we use an app called Nextdoor. And this is a, a great social media app that lets HOAs and neighborhoods around the campus know about the prescribed burn. Uh, we also use Viochi, which is more for emergency management. <clears throat> if you work for a city or county, and we let the, we treat the prescribed burn like an incident and we have an IEP that's listed on there so that the emergency managers can follow along with what's going on. And then obviously the Arboretum has a great outreach with Facebook and Instagram and letting our trail users and our students know what's going on. So with social media, um, we've had, um, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Sometimes people uh, kind of go with what they think's happening and as an information officer, you have to stay on top of that um, media um, and make sure it's interpreted correctly. So this is an example of some posts that we've had in the last two years. Um, some of them are kind of funny. Um, yeah, I wish Orange County, they're a great help um, to our program, but they don't have any wildland engines. And one of the um, persons here at Ginger Creek wanted us to bring a fire truck every time we do a controlled burn which isn't possible because you know they, they respond to medical calls. They can't always help us on entire prescribed burn. So our second step is 
um, fire line prep. So all our backlog units receive the same type of treatment and that's prepping with a skid steer or a bush hog 25 to 50 feet from all fire breaks. And what this does is it ensures firefighter safety and also the community, community safety by reducing the fire line intensity. And what it does is take those six to 10 foot tall palmetto and hardwoods down to the surface fuel. So those flame lengths are a lot less and you, you're probably gonna get less spot fires as a result in adjacent units. Uh, we've seen, we've been able to reduce pine mortality as a re result of crown scorch, that first order effect. So we're not getting those crown fires that we you know, could have, um, we're keeping at the surface level. But you have to remember with the, anytime you mulch this much, you have to worry about the duff issue. So I'll, I'll be able to bring up some uh, weather data that's useful for this. So this is some uh, pictures of our uh, green trail. Um, you see that the top photo on the right, you wouldn't wanna burn that the way it is. There's no disc line, there's 10 foot tall palmetto and we only wanna burn one side of that. So we have to prep the unit. And this is a picture of it immediately after the next burn or the, the next week after the burn. And you can see all that needle drop that's occurring. So this is a uh, example of what equipment we have at UCF. We have a skid steer 299D. We have a John Deere tractor. So I highly recommend if you don't have a skid steer, either renting one or hiring a contractor to conduct those, those fuel treatments. Um, you'll see better results post-fire and have a reduced chance of escape. Um, and then after this treatment's been conducted, the benefit uh, as a landowner, everybody should have a tractor with a bush hog. These fuels are now manageable to use a John Deere like that on the lower on the right corner to mow it with a bush hog and just keep your fire lines maintained and open. So we found that the combination of mechanical treatment com combined with prescribed fire is the quickest way to increase biodiversity. And I think you all know that, um, but it needs to be done in a timely se sequence. You don't wanna wait more than six months to do a burn after you mowed something. If it's longer than a year, then you start igniting that duff layer. So try to burn within six months after you do these uh, mechanical treatment projects. All right, this next one is real juicy. Um, I had to spend a lot of time looking at day of burn reports, weather, historical weather, and figured out a sweet spot on pine mortality. Um, so there's a lot of research from Morgan Varner and everybody that put effort into um, estimating duff and the amount of uh, moisture in duff. In Florida, we have KBDI that the Florida Forest Service does a really good job of keeping track of. But this is all, um, refresh your information if you're a burn manager, but um, this has been useful for us for these 10 to 50 year backlog units. So we have the wind speed three to seven, the RH uh, values range between 60 and 40%, um, sorry, 40 and 60%. Um, daytime dispersion between 40 and 60. And that's mainly for smoke management. It doesn't really have that much to do with fire effects. Um, days before the burn greater than a half an inch of rain. This is the number one factor that we need to consider. Um, there's a sweet spot about three to four days. If you get rain three or four days, you're gonna be able to burn enough duff but not impact pine mortality. And then the second most important factor that I listed is KBDI. And you want KBDI be, to be between 900, I mean, sorry, 90 and 200. And that is just a sweet spot that I observed uh, Morgan Varner in his study in 2009 and others um, found a weak correlation between organic um, moisture content and KBDI. But in Florida, the only really uh, measurement that we have is KBDI. So we need to learn how to use it. So <clears throat> when you get into that 250 to higher category of KBDI, that's kind of a gray area for pine mortality and duff consumption. If it's wetter than 90, then you're probably not gonna be able to achieve any duff reduction at all. It's just gonna burn the surface in that mid story. And you really aren't reducing the fuels across all categories from one hour to a thousand hours. And then the next thing I put on this is um, days after rain greater than one inch. And that needs to happen three days or less. And this helps with mop up. This helps cool the soil temperatures and reduce the uh, fine root loss in those pines. 
Um, ideally, if you can have a burn and it rain the same day, um, that's going to help you out greatly. Free mop up. And then consecutive nights with RH about 95% or higher. And that should happen about three or more days. So I'll probably get a lot of questions on this, but this is just the data that I was able to come up with and compare with other research. So some other applications that we've been successful with at UCF on our burn team, we've had, we have sprinkler kits um, and an effective mop up. So we have you know two to three engines helping us on these burns and it really helps out a lot after ignition is completed to be able to mop up effectively. And those MOU partners, um, they know how to do all that because it's, it's what we're trained to do. Um, so we know that when we call you for help that we're getting effective mop up. And then that helps me out as a burn boss the next day when I'm by myself, um, not having to worry about pine mortality. We've also had success using class A foam. Um, this prevents duff fires from occurring. Um, and it also reduces those post fire effects relating to mortality. Um, class A foam has come a long way since the 90s. It's more environmentally sensitive um, and it works just by smothering that fire and those surface seals by um, eliminating oxygen from continuing to ignite the, the, the fire and it also cools those fine roots and puts out the fire that way. We've also had success with raking. I know there's a lot of studies from Morgan Varner and others in 2009. Um, in their controlled study, they found that areas without heavy mulch or duff adjacent to the, the trunk of the tree reduce thermal in, injuries, that stem girdling I was talking about, and it also reduces the fine root mortality. Um, and there's a correlation between the carbohydrate reserves and the fine roots that are impacted. And <clears throat> with mop, with uh, duff fires, they can happen the first hour after ignition. ignition so. You have to start mop up relatively quickly with these units. And this is just to show you, <clears throat> we had about 5% mortality up by the tower dorms and the, the basketball stadium. And I think a lot of that had to do with our Arboretum volunteer students. We went out there and raked every pine, longleaf pine. And during the burn, it made ignition a lot easier. And then some other applications, you see the sprinkler kits. Um, we've had success using class A foam, batch mixed into tanks um, during mop up and also the second and third day of operations. And then with, with the sprinklers, you know, they take a long time to set up with a portable pump. Um, so you have to know how to put them together and they take a long time. But if you know that you're having duff issues with um, duff rings forming um, as a burn boss, it's a good idea to think about sprinklers if you have a water source nearby. So building on the closing of the conclusions, um, I hope this model kind of offers some guidance or refresher for finding that ideal um, threshold for weather um, and fuels. Um, fire line prep, everybody's prepping their units. You know, obviously we're all connected. We don't want our fires to get out of control because that affects the entire community and the state. So we want all these high urban interface burns to be successful. Um, just to recap, the three greatest factors in weather that I highlighted were rain being greater than half an inch between day and three. The KBDI needs to be between 900 and 200. And then the rain occurring after the burn needs to be at least one inch, three days or less. We also found that burning smaller acres in these backlog units, ranging between 10, 10 to 30 acres during various times of year, um, primarily dormant season, because there's a correlation between bark beetles and growing season burns. We don't want too many bark beetles to kill all our trees. So um, between Jeffrey Eckwart and I, we, we actually came up with dormant season burning actually reduces bark beetle infestations. Um, and then also having different locations of the burn. So every time we burn in these backlog units, the stress trees reduce pheromones. So if you can spread out your forest and your burn units, you're reducing the amount of pheromones released at a given time by burning smaller acreages and in different locations. So some other uh, research topics that I kind of came up with for more uh, tall timbers and for other agencies to look into. 
with urbanized communities, there may be additional stressors um, relating to pine survival, such as bark beetle populations, or there's a resilience factor that I came up with and other researchers are looking at between Slack, Sherman, and Barner. Um, <clears throat> so it's hard for us to judge a pine resilience factor just by looking at the tree's appearance. A lot of these mature longleaf pines, they have large canopies, they have large DBHs, they have the thick bark, but as soon as we introduce a fire, um, they either die from duff fires or bark beetles. So how can we as researchers identify how a pine tree is more resilient? Is it the repeat of stress of prescribed burning or wildfires? And that gets back to that frequency over season. Um, so that's something that I wanna encourage our research community to look more into. We know that duff fires obviously are the number one cause of mortality, but there could be something else and that could be either the amount of carbohydrates in the fine roots after a burn. Maybe that varies between a, ma a maintenance burn and a backlog burn. Is it the thickness of the bark and the flakiness of the bark that determines resilience? Or is it some kind of immune system response? So these are things that we need to look at as researchers. Um, I put down there, a smooth sea never made a skillful sailor. And my thoughts are, if you introduce a disturbance like a prescribed burn or wildfire, that you can build up that resilience. And then the last thing about bark beetles and urbanized communities. So there may be a correlation between how much urban landscape we have and these backlog urban communities uh, or natural areas. So what if the bark beetle populations are increasing because we got rid of their original food source being yellow pine species? So that makes as land managers more challenging to do these burns because you only have a certain amount of natural areas left in central Florida and those bark beetle numbers may be increasing. There could also be a, a climate change function that we need to research more. So all these topics just reiterate the, the challenges of reintroducing fire, but I hope that this, uh, this fire model inspires you to keep going because we have been successful at UCF. Um, there's a lot of units like this throughout Central Florida that need uh, fire uh, mechanical treatment. So I just hope this encourages you to keep going and um, there is a way to find a sweet spot in the weather and to be safe at the same time. So I'm sure there's a lot of questions from that. So we'll take some time to answer any questions. Hey Brent, uh, Ben here. Okay, yeah, we, I know we need to move relatively quickly because we're running a little over time, but we'll go through, a, spend at least five minutes on questions. Um, so the first one is, any idea of the basal area of your units that had significant beetle infestations? And also, was any pine thinning reduced or reduction done beforehand? So the only pine thinning that we did related to hardwoods, so cabbage palms, um, laurel oaks, water oaks, we didn't necessarily do any, uh, because we are a university and high traffic area, we didn't do any logging treatments like we uh, were discussing in the beginning stages. So this was the first time that any major disturbance got introduced besides the fire line prep. That's yeah. a good question. And I think thinning could work, but we just, yeah, we couldn't really get loggers in here for the size of our units. And yeah. um, it's a lot to do on our own, but yeah. So you help. can, <clears throat> because you know that you're probably gonna have some, um, some goal in the stand density resulting from prescribed fire. Jeffrey Neckwart and I talked about this. Um, Pre-logging, if you can find a low impact solution to um, a single tree harvest before the burn, um, and you know that you're gonna kill pines anyway, you can do this, but you have to realize that increasing that soil compaction is gonna bring in more stress and more bark beetles. So you have to do that carefully. And then you also have to you know, consider salvage logging. So right now we, you know, some units have 50% mortality. We could have, you know, between three months or less salvage log those trees that are impacted based on the duff rings or the crown scorch. So that's another option too, but we just don't have the acreages to make the operation of the timber cell possible. Okay. Uh, next question is, why did you choose pine mortality as a success measure? And were there other considerations uh, for grass recruitment, palmetto cover, ground cover, et cetera, included. And then pines can become overabundant where it goes unburned for too long periods. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And I, in my, in the section of my talk that I gave, I did, you know, Brent, I think, chose to focus on the pine mortality because it's just something that popped out when, when he looked at the data on some of the burns. Those areas did have probably excessive crown. Some of them had too much crown to begin with for what we would maybe shoot for. But we've seen, we have some data, limited data, and we've obviously seen very good response in the ground cover. That's where it's all really happening. But uh, our data are somewhat limited, but you can see it with your eyes. Uh, what you do have with the uh, excessive dieback is then the crown, you know, the canopy recovery takes longer. We have done some strategic planting in some areas of small longleaf pine just to try to accelerate that process. But you now the ground cover responses can be excellent even with a high crown mortality. So we did, and this was just the, the pine mortality is a factor I looked at because that was the downside of doing these units because it was a reduction in tree mortality. But every, our objectives for every burn is reducing surface fuels by at least 25 to 50%, um, getting rid of that mid-story canopy, and then also increasing biodiversity. Um, so the, the goal here is to introduce at least one to two dormant season burns and then get those fuel loadings down. Because if you don't deal with the fuel issue or the public safety factor, you're never going to be able to do a, a growing season burn. Um, so eventually, oh. we're, we're, we are now actually doing growing season burns with some of these backlog units. So we're seeing that biodiversity and that season come in. So um, we did the other look thing at this. The other thing I would say is that the death of the trees does, there's a public perception issue too. People said, oh, you know, UCS trees are dying when we burned along a roadway. And, you know, I basically, you know, had the opportunity to speak to some people and tell them what great, you know, biodiversity responses we were having. That Then it was like, oh, okay, we can accept dead trees. That's okay. So there is a public perception aspect to that too in an urban environment where you have a lot of people who are going to observe what you're doing and see the responses. All right. And we'll do one last question. Uh, have you found issues with raking around pines with duff and the fire or fine feeder roots being damaged in the process? And do you wait a few weeks to apply fire after raking to give the fine roots time to recover? Yeah, so that unit that we did by the tower dorms, unit 4A, um, you can definitely see those fine roots, those white roots kind of form at the surface of the upper uh, organic layer. And uh, we did wait about six months before the burn. So I think that that is something that we can look more into. I think Morgan Varner researched that, the timing of raking. But uh, to answer your question, with the 5% 5 5 mortality unit 4A, we waited six months to do the burn after the raking and then about six months after the mechanical treatment. All righty, I think that's all the time we have. So I'll pass it along to Sammy for our next speaker.